blue. Hello, we're live. Stay blue. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Nicole Forbes with Dennis's 7Ds. Thanks for tuning in today. I'm here to talk about indoor plant pest control. It's, uh, it's not, you know, a happy topic necessarily to talk about, but it's a reality of, um, it's, a, it's a reality of caring for plants or anytime we have plants in our home or plants in our garden, even just one plant can come down with a pest. Uh, but the more plants you have, the more pest pressure there may be. And by constantly bringing in just one more plant or a new plant and adding it to your indoor plant community, <clears throat> it's always a good idea to have preventative measures in place, as well as be aware of how to eliminate or treat uh, various and some of the most common plant pests that we can talk about today. So with, um, with a little bit of information, a little bit of knowledge, and just a few products that are necessary. So you don't have to have like a whole medicine cabinet full of, you know, concoctions and tinctures. Um, I mean, you could if you want, but really, um, and you'll see there's a handout that's attached to the um, video of just below the top, the title that gives you all the information that we're talking about and some good pictures as well. But basically, um, a ready to use form of neem oil or concentrate of neem oil that you mix up yourself into a spray bottle. Uh, that's probably one of the most important preventative as well as uh, treatment type pro uh, products. And then either a homemade insecticidal soap or just to be easy, we've got a you know, pre-mixed, pre-made, ready to spray insecticidal soap that comes in a couple of different uh, size containers for you know convenience. We uh, often talk about mosquito bits for fungus gnats, so I've got mosquito bits here today. And then something that we don't often talk about but is mentioned in the blog and I use at home are sticky traps. Uh, so I'll get into sticky traps in a little bit uh, as well, but sticky traps are great. And then kind of the, if all else fails, uh, this is a systemic houseplant insect control that goes into the soil and is watered into the plant and usually will give it a couple of months, six, eight weeks worth of insect protection um, for potted plants specifically. So this protects against aphids and whiteflies, mealybugs, scale, and um, some of the most common houseplant pests without having to do any spray um, and repeated spray treatment. So that can be an issue, but it's, you know, where do they come from is often what I get asked. I mean, how did this plant get spider mites or whatever? I mean, these houseplant pests come uh, from open doors, come in on pets, uh, come from another plant perhaps that you brought in that, you know, didn't notice it had a few pests and then they spread to the plant community in your homes. They may come on a flower bouquet. Uh, they're just small present in the air. It's like germs are, you know, germs are out there. Pests are out there. Uh, and once they go into our homes with the doors closed and are somewhat isolated from like the natural system, there are no predators usually to feed off of and control the population of pests indoors. So some of these pests may live outside as well, but the cycle of nature uh, gives them a check uh, from the population getting too large by having a you know higher food chain predator that may feed off of and hunt those insects when they're outside. We don't have those necessarily inside. It's really a great idea to just have like a maintenance program in place where not only you are doing a regular inspection of your plants. So that's like every two weeks, giving them a thorough inspection, <clears throat> also keeping the foliage as clean as possible, cleaning the leaves, dusting, uh, spraying the leaves off in the shower uh, occasionally, for example, all of the cleaning 
thinning that's done will not only help the leaf function more efficiently, so photosynthesize, a cleaner leaf can photosynthesize better than a dusty leaf, but little bits of dust may actually also be concealing other pests that are, you know, pests that are present. So dust could actually be spider mites and it just looks kind of dusty to you. So uh, the cleaner the leaf, the easier it is to sp spot your pests and just simply the healthier the plant is. And most of us know just like our, uh, our health, the, the, the better you make lifestyle choices, you know, the healthier you live, good rest, uh, proper nutrition, good hydration, reduce your stress load. All of those things go a long ways to compare house plants and their ability to thrive when properly cared for, regularly fertilized, given the right light and watering so that they aren't stressed. And therefore they are less likely to really come down with a serious pest issue. <clears throat> It is also, so aside from a regular maintenance program and cleaning your leaves, so inspecting and cleaning at least every two weeks, it is also wise to have a space in your home if you are a regular indoor plant addict, uh, as I am, and you're constantly bringing home a new plant to join your indoor collection, it's really, really suggested that you quarantine your new plant. I know that we're living in times of quarantine and all the, you know, masking that we're doing again and all these things. So it's quite understood the uh, kind of concept of quarantine and how important that is. Taking a new plant home, putting it in a room that has no other plants will give you a chance for 10 to 14 days to observe that new plant and determine whether or not it has a pest and therefore then either treat that pest or allow your plant then to you know mix and mingle in with the rest of the plants in your home. That is a good way to avoid accidentally infesting a large group of plants from you know one cheap like discount palm that you bought at Lowe's when you just couldn't resist it. Um, you know, not saying that I've done anything like that, but maybe it's happened uh, once or twice in the past to someone. So let's kind of just, you know, go down the list on some of the most common indoor plant pests and what to do about it. Now, one of the things I've, I've got on my table here, um, I'm not in the jungle today, although I do often just, you know, fill every spot on this table. I just have some of kind of the most common indoor plants or representatives of common indoor plants and some that are like plants that are known to have specific pests. And that is also a really great thing to learn is when you have specific plants in your home, find out what pests they're most likely to encounter. Palms, for example, don't often get aphids. Uh, it's just not, you know, aphids are not a pest for palms. They can, however, get spider mites and they also often can get mealybugs. So spider mites and mealybugs, probably the two most common pests for palms. Uh, another common pest on palms might be scale, um, but it, that usually is on a different type of palm than this uh, rapis palm or the lady palm that I have here. On my left, uh, stage right, I guess, I've got cast iron plant. Two different types of really cool cast iron plants. This is Aspidistra for those of us that are uh, botanical speaking. Um, the, this is Moon and Stars. And then I've got um, Milky Way here. So two kind of cool variegated or blotchy dotted foliage of the cast iron plants. And just like, a, you know, your cast iron uh, cookware at home. These are durable, sturdy, like hard to mess with plants, but they have one potential pest problem and that's spider mites. So I have cast iron plants over here. One of them is actually um, showing early signs of spider mites. So we're going to treat that um, and I'll show you kind of how, how I do that today, but it is important to kind of 
pre-guess what pest you're going to look for when you're doing an inspection on your cast iron plant so that every two weeks I don't have to think maybe any pest that's possible is going to be on the cast iron plant. I'm really checking it for spider mites and signs of spider mites. So it's a really easy thing is just to start learning what the most likely pest your plants are uh, going to encounter or could potentially encounter so that then you've got that um, first thing to look for or first thing to check. Fungus gnats are a pest that doesn't <clears throat> tend to have plant favorites. It's um, an equal opportunity pest that prefers moist soil. So I would say that usually fungus gnats are not present on succulents or cactus, but that again goes with um, the understanding that succulents and cactus want to be dry and are dry soil plants. Uh, so typically it wouldn't be a really heavily watered or wet plant. <clears throat> but plants that do like regular watering, um, maybe a peace lily, for example, a spathophyllum, they, with keeping the soil too frequently moist and not giving it a chance to dry out a little between waterings, can create a, an environment where a small fungus begins to grow due to that wetness of the soil. And then a, a insect that's a tiny little black gnat uh, is attracted to that fungus and lays eggs on the soil surface and the little egg hatches into a tiny thin worm and the worm or larva lives in the soil eating up that fungus that's grown but it also feeds on the roots of the plants and so will just weaken the plant in general. You don't see necessarily insects on the plant because the real damage is being done in the roots. But what you will notice when you have fungus gnats is uh, the presence of the adult flying gnats. So they are small, um, they're dark in color, and I would say approximately size of a fruit fly, but even a little bit smaller than a fruit fly. So thinner body than a fruit fly. They are still often found in, uh, you know, like my morning coffee uh, or in the evening, they'll blend into a glass of wine. That may be the most likely uh, sign. The first sign that I see is a little gnat in my beverage. And then I will, of course, you know, hone in on which plant it is that has got the fungus gnats. And usually it's the plant that maybe was most recently repotted because repotting a plant gives it extra soil and potentially that extra soil is holding extra moisture after watering. And it's that delicate balance between getting the watering right and allowing the plant to dry out a little in between that uh, we need to kind of figure out and often adjust our watering after we've repotted for just that reason. So now, if you're not sure if you do or don't have fungus gnats, <clears throat> again, the sticky white traps are a great way to, or excuse me, sticky traps are a great way to figure that out. So this is just a, um, like a mechanical method of catching pests. In some cases, this can help you to identify the pest more than really like control the population. So whether or not you have them present, you can get uh, the peel the little backing off. Well, it's front and back of this card is a little wax paper that peels off and then the card itself is very sticky. <clears throat> the grid kind of helps again, you figure out how many pests you may have and it's sticky on both sides, which means that you could, for example, attach it to something like a toothpick, a chopstick. If you've got nothing else at home, stick it to a pencil and then shove that down into the soil of your plant so that it just sits amongst the plant and in many cases the yellow color sometimes they have a pheromone added um, but either way they're going to attract the pest that will stick to the gluey surface and allow you to either you know collect as many as you can and then remove the sticky trap and replace it with a new one or identify what it is that's really your problem whether it's a thrips or a white fly or a 
a mealy bug or a fungus gnat, you will stick them onto this card or they will stick onto this card and then you can identify them and then go forward with the most appropriate treatment um, once you know what you're dealing with. Now, fungus gnats, again, once we've gotten them stuck to the trap or we find them floating in our coffee, can be treated with a couple of different products. But most important, as I mentioned, <clears throat> is realizing that you're possibly keeping your plants too wet. And that can lead further down the line to all kinds of other problems like root rot and uh, fungal disease problems with the leaves. So backing off on your watering, aerating your soil or possibly even changing the soil mix to something that is better draining um, or more coarse or porous that is all going to allow your soil to dry out more in between watering <clears throat> this product is uh, mosquito bits which is a natural uh, bacteria again this is bacillus thuringiensis subspecies israeliensis which you'll see on your handout as bti BT is used um, out in the, the vegetable garden and out in our flowers to attack specific caterpillars that do damage outside. But the BTI, the Israeliensis subspecies, works to kill mosquito larvae and fungus gnat larvae, amongst a few other uh, pests. Can be sprinkled into bird baths or fountains or you know old tires in your yard. But also these little mosquito bits which are kind of chunky, yeah, this is sealed. Chunky little, uh, kind of looks like oats or something, but they're a little bit chunkier. This is uh, sprinkled over the surface of your potting soil uh, on the plants that have the fungus gnats. And then when you water, it dissolves the solution and waters it in. You can also soak this in water directly and then use the soaking water to water in your house plants to deliver that bacteria down, which will kill the larva of the fungus gnats down in the soil. So um, you'll also see on the handout, we mentioned diatomaceous earth, which is a very fine powder. Both of these are all natural, um, can be used in organic gardening, can be used for people that have chemical sensitivity, especially in the house. We always wanna think about that. Diatomaceous earth can be spread as a fine powder over the surface of your house plant's topsoil. And as the larvae emerge as adults, they have to crawl through the soil and then come out to fly around in the house. And as they emerge, they crawl through the diatomaceous earth and that um, is like a tiny, sharp, it's like powdered glass to the bugs. So they basically get a, um, a dose of that and, and many don't survive. So diatomaceous earth though needs to be reapplied after watering. It doesn't work as well when it's wet, whereas the mosquito bits can be added to water or uh, applied as a top dressing and then water is actually carrying the product down to the root zone where you want it. Fungus gnats again, um, extremely common and can in the long run, they can kill a plant in uh, serious infestations, but usually by that time, you know, you've got bugs, little bugs flying around and you may have, um, you know, gotten sick of the plant and put it outside or uh, thrown it out already or something like that. So it's not uncommon. Most of us have dealt with them. And a few uh, may just tell you that you're watering too much. Uh, once you've really got an issue, like I said, um, it's best to go after the problem with one of those solutions that I've just indicated. Now, <clears throat> there's no particular order to the pests that we're talking about today. So the next one is spider mites. And spider mites is really a, <clears throat> spider mites is a common summer problem. <clears throat> Very common in summer, both indoors and outdoors. And it's most common on plants that are in brighter light or full sun and sometimes plants that are right in the window getting possibly even a little bit of direct sunlight on the on their foliage. Spider mites prefer warmth and heat so that's why they hang out on that sun uh, sun exposed side of the plant usually. Spider mites are also 
uh, found on predictable, usually quite predictable lists of plants. They tend to like plants that have long, thin foliage, so grassy or strappy long foliage, such as the cast iron plant has, such as the individual leaflets of Our Lady Palm. And another common plant to come down with spider mites is the very well-known Dracaena <clears throat> and most forms of Dracaena, but this marginata especially, can come down with spider mites. And it's one of the few things that really bothers this plant. So it's a good, good one to recognize and learn how to spot early and treat. Spider mites, so here's one of the things about these indoor plant pests. Outside, if you're experienced in gardening outside, if you look at a leaf and there's bite marks in it or holes in it or it's missing altogether, you know you've got a pest. Something's eating my plant, we can say. We see that the leaf has been damaged. We see chewing or evidence of the pest. Most of our indoor plant pests aren't chomping and munching away at the leaves, showing us obvious signs that they are there making leaves disappear. They're like vampires in the plant world. They're piercing and sucking the juices and saps out of the leaves. So first of all, you don't really see that damage happening until the plants just had so much removed, so much uh, past pressure that it starts to show signs of deterioration. Some other indoor plant pests, again, rather than piercing and sucking, they have like a sandpaper type mouth apparatus that just slowly scrapes away the cells on the leaf tissue surface so that we see very minimal damage early on, but eventually that damage starts to, you know, become something that we can catch with our eyes. <clears throat> That's what a thrips does, for example. They have this little sandpaper type um, rasping uh, mouth part. So aphids, mealybugs, spider mites, they're all piercing and sucking insects. Uh, scale, another sucking insect. And then we've got the thrips, which are this like rasping type uh, insect. None of them have big mouth chewy parts that are gonna bite you or bite your plant, or, you know, bite your plant leaf and make it disappear. Now, often, you'll learn, just like I'm saying, you learn that your certain plants are likely to have certain pests. We learn, our eyes learn pattern recognition. So we learn to spot those pests from, even from a distance by an, uh, spider mites, for example, the leaf will often have a dull or slightly off color to it. It won't be shiny and vibrant. It won't have this beautiful green sheen to it. It may appear dull, matte, and maybe even slightly dusty, as I mentioned before. And a, a spider mite, let's just say spider mites come in units. Now they are individual, they are a mite. Uh, as I say in the handout, they're like smaller than the size of a period at the end of one of the sentences. So they are very, very tiny. They are the type of thing that I will use a jeweler's loop or a hand lens to really get a good look at spider mites and see whether or not they are still crawling around or alive or if maybe they're even dead, but now I'm spotting the damage. <clears throat> and spider mites reproduce extremely quickly. So usually you're not gonna ever see one spider mite. You are gonna see a thousand spider mites on a leaf and as that infestation grows and reproduces, ultimately, rather than the spider mite individual or group, what you'll see is a, a light, very, very fine webbing that will coat the leaf surface or be on the undersides of the leaves with a very fine webbing. Something that still is uh, barely visible by your eye, but you need a really good light if you wanna see it. A magnifying glass or a hand lens will also see. 
it doesn't look like spider's webs like uh, Charlotte's web or anything. It's a very fine webbing and again it's usually concentrated around the leaf and the leaf surface. And then you may even uh, be able to spot in bright light very, very tiny mites crawling around on that webbing and on the, on the leaf surface as well. So spider mites are, first of all, uh, able to spread from plant to plant. So usually uh, any single one of these pests, as soon as you identify that you've got it, back to the quarantine room it goes. So a nice isolation space. Uh, for me in my home, it's my laundry room. My laundry room has these gorgeous south-facing windows. It stays pretty warm. It's kind of high in humidity. And it's, um, it's not a place that I normally am just going to like decorate with houseplants. In fact, I've had some you know, really messy spills uh, as I was, you know, taking plants out of or taking things out of the wash or dryer and grabbed a house plant that was on one of the shelves or whatever. So I try not to have a lot of plants in my laundry room, but that is where my new plant quarantine and or potential pest treatment space is since there are no other plants in there that can get sick. So having an isolation space, if you don't have a room that has lovely southern windows like my laundry room does, a small plant light. Um, get a little miracle LED that we sell as bulbs and screw it into a little desk lamp and at least give that little struggling plant uh, a light while it's in its um, recovering uh, situation so that you can help it along rather than putting it into a dark room where it may also just kind of, you know, decline for various other reasons while it's trying to get over having a pest. Signs again, spider mites don't, uh, you know, they're not going to eat the leaf. They will slowly, the leaf will slowly turn completely brown if you don't notice it, but usually you're going to catch that uh, webbing or other signs beforehand. Another thing you can do with a leaf that you think may have spider mites, and I've got a good picture in the handout, but I also brought a tomato leaf that I found with spider mites on it. So the appearance of the leaf is frosty. So you can see that it's kind of white speckled, yellow speckled. It's lost a lot of its green color. And from the, you can't see them, I can't even see them without bright, bright light and a magnifying glass. If we looked, we would see tiny, tiny spider mites all on the undersides of this leaf. They're not on the tops. They like to hang out on the bottoms. <clears throat> and again, this is the type of thing that I would put my flashlight on on my phone, for example, grab my little jeweler's loop and look up close at the detail to figure out whether they are still crawling around um, and whether it's something that I needed a treat. Now, sometimes also, this is not a dark piece of paper. Sometimes you can take a dark piece of paper, still not dark, and take your leaf, clean sheet, kind of smash it on the paper a couple of times, and then look closely at your paper. Often, you can get the little mites to knock off onto the paper. They're very, very tiny though, so sometimes I have to like circle the little bits that fall off onto the paper. Then maybe they're just dust or dirt. But you'll also notice though, if the little piece of dust in the circle starts to move around, then you realize that it's something that's alive. Uh, and that's a good confirmation that you have the mites. So some bashing onto a clean paper surface, very close inspection. Maybe again, bright light, magnifying lens, all of those things will confirm the presence of the spider's mites. Uh, in addition to these types of, you know, symptoms where you can see that real frosty, funky look on the leaf. Now, to treat spider mites, really the best thing to use on spider mites is oil. Uh, there are, a range of oil products that you can use. 
horticultural spray oil is mineral oil, essentially. We often use neem oil. Uh, neem oil works as a miticide, fungicide, and insecticide. So it's going to um, have kind of the broadest range of applications. So neem oil on a preventative basis can be used especially on plants that we know are likely to come down with spider mites. So our cast iron plants, we know that it's very possible, if not likely, that we'll have spider mites on our cast iron plant. So our maintenance can be a leaf wipe down or cleaning every couple of weeks. That makes the leaves even just prettier in general. So neem oil and all oils can stain <clears throat> so you don't want to you know get the oil on your walls or your carpet for example my little table here has a plastic tablecloth on it so i'm gonna be okay spraying but i wouldn't leave the plant on the you know heirloom wood coffee table and spray next to your couch for example just take it either into the bathroom bathtub or you have a very small space that you're working with you can often take just a standard garbage bag this is like a kitchen size but you could get a big garbage bag if you have a big plant put your plant inside the garbage bag pull the sides up and then use your spray inside the bag so you can kind of use the bag as uh, protective sides spray inside of it even you know lay the plant down on its side to get the undersides of the leaves it's not as easy to work with but at least again it's going to keep things um, kind of contained and then of course neem oil also has a slight fragrance so i don't care for the smell of it and if i don't want to smell that spray after i've sprayed my plant i could theoretically maybe blow a little air in it there that makes a little greenhouse for it now I could tie it up so that the plant sits inside of it with that spray and even potentially you know if I think oh spider mites are jumping off of it trying to save themselves well they're all going to be contained in this nice little uh, temporary greenhouse while it gets treated and I don't have to smell it and it kept my you know my furniture safe and clean so that's one way to apply spray neem oil can be either sprayed directly onto the leaf surface both tops and but and you know front and back or tops and bottoms however you want to Look at it. <clears throat> or for like regular maintenance and, and uh, every two weeks kind of cleaning, you can take a nice soft cloth off. And I think, you know, well, that's what I do with all the single socks that come out of the dryer. What, you, what else are you going to do with them? Put, you know, make sock mittens or sock gloves out of them. They're perfect to then wash your plant leaves. So then a nice wipe down will again get any kind of dirt and dust off. We always want to do fronts and backs, which is why I like to have two socks. Um, they don't have to match, but a sock on each hand will help you to kind of absorb and easily clean the leaf surface. We want to get into kind of cracks and crevices because that's where the bugs like to hide. It's a little like pleats, dents on the leaf. We want to make sure that the oil has gotten into that and is sort of soaked down the leaf surface. So I'm going to spray this side one more time. Now when I spray it, I can actually see a little bit of the uh, easier. I can see the signs of the mites on here. So this guy's going to get some good treatment and an isolation until we're sure uh, that those mites are gone and even just after cleaning it's shiny it looks better 
it's just kind of overall a prettier plant when the leaves are glossy and green and shiny looking instead of, I don't know, big dust collectors, uh, kind of pale and, you know, dirty looking. So, an improved look, an improved health, and just simple, you know, simple cleaning, simple plant maintenance. So same kind of thing on your palm leaf. This is, uh, takes a lot more detail. This is the kind of thing that you either like put on a podcast, like put your earbuds in and call your mom or call your best friend and just have a nice long conversation while you're just cleaning away on the leaves. It's a very like centering and calming thing to do, especially if you're doing it preventative and you're not chasing after bugs. When you're trying to get bugs uh, you know, that you already have a problem with that can be a little bit distressing because it feels like you're never going to get all of them gone. Um, but be, you know, be persistent. And in most cases, you can overcome these issues. <clears throat> On to aphids. I'm going to skip aphids. They're the most common outdoor pest, but we don't see a lot of aphids commonly in indoor plants. If you do have an aphid problem, chances are really good that it is also in correlation to um, over fertilizing. So if you give your plant uh, too much fertilizer, too high in nitrogen specifically, you're going to push out new, new growth that's really soft and really tender. And that's where the aphids like to focus on because again, remember, they're little vampires. So the more tender the leaf surface is, the easier for them to little, you know, pierce and suck on. They don't want an old, thick, waxy leaf. They want this brand new, thin, succulent, tender leaf. So the more new growth you have, that's likely that you'll have some aphids that can be pruned away. Again, we just suggest a basic 312 indoor plant food. So nothing crazy, nothing that pushes too much nitrogen. And just keep an eye out for aphids. Um, usually, again, uh, you'll notice them as a large group. <clears throat> aphids are easy to treat. So neem oil, again, works on them. Insecticidal soap works on them. <clears throat> you can catch them with the sticky traps. Identify them. Um, bring in your sticky trap if you don't know. You know, if it, you collect a bunch of bugs on it and you don't know what they are, we can help identify them as well. So on to mealy bugs, but I guess I want to back up for just a sec. So if you can't see that you have a pest, but your plant's not doing great, this is a good example. I actually took this plant out of the dumpster. We don't tend to wait and try to treat a lot of things. We don't want our plants to get any other plants sick. So we'll just take a plant that looks poor and, and get rid of it instead. It doesn't happen very often, so we're fortunate in that way. So this stromanthe just came out of the dumpster. It has clearly um, either came in, you know, uh, struggled in shipment or whatever its problems have been. It's seen better days. I pulled it out because I wanted to have a good example of a pest to show today. And so after bright light and a little bit of inspection, I was able to find mealybug. I mean, two, but I found mealybug on this plant. So I have an example of mealybug that we can actually see other than the photograph that you see in the handout. But often we don't see the bugs. What we see <clears throat> in addition to the plant just simply not thriving or slow growth, or weak stems, or shriveled leaves, or brown edges. What we may also see is something that's referred to as honeydew. I mean, that's such a gross name for it because it's, um, it's a sticky, kind of shiny substance that you will see usually either on a leaf of the plant or on the coffee table, or on the floor even, underneath a big floor plant. 
And the honeydew or sticky, shiny substance is actually the excrement of the pest that you have that you can't see. So it's their pee, basically, because they're like drinking sweet, syrupy plant sugars, <clears throat> which are the juices that plants make. And as they, you know, process it uh, through their bodies, they have a, a waste and their waste comes out as a sticky kind of sugary substance. Sometimes you'll see ants on your plant because ants also are interested in this sticky substance and they will often protect and even kind of help uh, foster or farm a population of scale or aphids because they value that sweet substance that their excrement is. Now I say that all of this because again, you might see shiny, sticky something on your end table, on your coffee table, on the floor, on the plant itself and not identify that as any kind of problem. But if you do see that, it's important to look, if it's on the plant, look at the leaf above, for example, where the shiny stuff is and you may see evidence of the, of the pest. Or if it's on your coffee table, again, same thing, looking at that portion of the plant that's over the, the stain or the, the, the mark, you will most likely then see signs of whatever pest it is that's causing that problem. You just have to look really closely and in some cases even know what you're going to look for, which the pictures that we've given you should help to identify some of those pests. Now, the mealy bug that I found, I don't know if you'll be able to see it or not. Is that a bro? Uh, so I've drawn arrows and tried to make it as clear as possible. Pointing with my pencil, it is a little whitish cream. Let's see. It's right here. Oh, I'm sorry. I pull it away some or? Yeah. There we go. Oh, okay. I'm going to. Yeah. Get it with my pencil. So, okay. It's in and out. <clears throat> so we have a picture of it. Now I have it on the head of my pencil. That's how small it is. So some mealybug get larger than others. Um, but this guy is now on the tip of the pencil. <clears throat> it's able to be like scraped off or removed. But it's um, usually, again, there's more there that are either smaller in size um, or more than you realize. So treating them individually, you can remove them. You can go after a mealybug with like a cotton swab or a Q-tip dipped in alcohol. Try to uh, scratch off or remove as many as possible. But still always a good idea to follow up with a spray because you never know if you've gotten them all or not. Now, <clears throat> further down on the same plant, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Here we go. Further down on the same plant, you can see the more cottony. Uh, can you see it? A little bit. More cottony appearance oh, there we go. of the mealy bug. So it's in, kind of tucked down into the center here, and it just looks like white fuzz. But believe it or not, that's a pest. The insect is kind of covered in this protective fuzz, which helps to make it harder for us to get a spray on because that fuzz kind of keeps the insect safe inside. But again, once I've seen and removed maybe the worst leaves and this one had a pest on it, just take it off. Now I'm going to go after this by just a basic spray especially where I knew where those, where that pest was and spray it specifically. Now, as I mentioned, this plant's going back into the dumpster, so um, it's really kind of a moot point, but this is how we would take care of a situation um, such as a mealybug. And again, these leaves, they point down, so all the spray rolls off. So putting it into that little bag is gonna help to keep your house clean or whatever. 
you could spray in a garage uh, or in a garden shed or something like that. But always be careful about neem oil or even any kind of spray if you get uh, direct light, direct sunlight or direct light on a wet leaf that's been sprayed with oil especially, it can sunburn. So just keeping it in uh, indirect or low light while it's recovering um, and while it's wet is really important. Now, <clears throat> mealybugs again can be caught with those sticky traps. It's, uh, they don't move around a lot, so it's only when you get basically mealybugs in their juvenile or crawling stage that you'll likely catch them on the sticky traps, but that crawling young stage is actually one of the easiest times to spray and kill them. So once you see them on your traps, that's when you would want to jump into action and then go ahead with the spray. Insecticidal soap also is effective against mealybugs. So you could use something like insecticidal soap uh, instead of neem oil. And it's always good to kind of mix up your sprays no matter what. So if you're always doing leaf shine with neem oil, uh, if it's possible, then treat your pest with insecticidal soap so that, so that you're kind of, you know, left hook, left, left hook, and then right hook, right? So sounding like a boxer. I'm not a boxer. But I can box my bugs. Now, <clears throat> scale and thrips. Those are the last two that we really are going to talk about. And these are, uh, it's almost progressively harder and harder to diagnose some of these insects. Scale does not look like a bug at all. Scale looks like, I mean, I guess mealybugs didn't really look like bugs either. They looked like little white, white fuzz bits. Scale looks like little brown, usually bumps on your plant. Um, they can be Usually they can be scratched off with your fingertip or again, uh, I go after them with my little pencil lead and you can get them off of the plant. Often you don't see any like damage underneath them on the leaf that they were on because they're like just sucking juices out of the plant. They're not doing localized damage where they're attached. Scale can grow to, well, there's different types of scale. Scale can grow to be uh oh maybe almost a quarter eighth to a quarter of an inch in size but often start even smaller than that and you will see again a picture on the handout they tend to be on the undersides of most leaves and usually right at the connection where the leaf meets the stem so if i were now this rubber plant this is a burgundy ficus decora the rubber tree, a rubber plant, this is a plant that can be known to have uh, scale problems. Spider mites are another one that happens to uh, infect sometimes the ficus um, family. But if we have scale on this, usually the scale are either going to be on the top of the leaf or on the bottom of the leaf, right along the mid rib, so the main vein that runs down the center of the leaf, they will most likely be where the stem of the leaf and the main part of the leaf connect. So kind of at this point right here is where you'll often see the scale, but definitely also always inspect that mid rib all the way along for anything that looks out of the ordinary, a bump, a lump, see if you can scratch it off um, those. And then you're gonna look closer, brighter light, smaller hand lens, to identify for sure whether or not you've got scale. Then going after it, scale we smother more than anything else. So scale is usually easily treated with oil sprays. And then again, you can go after the individual scale with a, a cotton swab or a Q-tip, dip directly into rubbing alcohol, and then just you know rub off each individual scale that kind of dries them out um, from the surface. They have like an armor coated outer covering that keeps most sprays from actually getting into them. So the oil smothers the pest instead of, again, acting as a chemical control for them. So smothering is always effective. You just need to sometimes 
spray a couple of times to make sure that you've caught all of the scales since they can be kind of hiding and in different spots on the leaf, uh, which make it hard to, you know, angle your spray and get them everywhere. Now, another common plant to get scale and spider mites is citrus. And often citrus, like lemons and things, we're growing outdoors for spring and summer. And then as we get closer to frost, we may bring our citrus indoors. Any plant that has spent the, spent even a couple of weeks outside, if you're going to bring it back indoors, I would just assume that it is infested with some sort of pest automatically. I'm not going to wait. I'm not going to put it in quarantine and wait and find out. I'm going to spray off a plant that's been living outside before it comes in the house, usually with just something simple like insecticidal soap. Then it's going to go straight into my quarantine room to make sure that it is clean before I let it into kind of the general house with all of my indoor plants. Just a smart way to make sure that you aren't accidentally unleashing, you know, total destruction um, in your home, <clears throat> in your house plants, that is. The last, the last pest to talk about today is one that I am currently struggling with at home, and those are uh, thrips. So thrips has an S at the end, and thrips is what one thrips is a thrips, and a hundred thrips are thrips. So it's uh, one of those that you don't call it a thrip, it's always a thrips. Thrips are tan, yellow, or light brown in color. And again, oh, so tiny that they are very difficult to spot. The easiest signs of thrips include this very same uh, yellowing and curling eventually browning even, of the leaf surface, the edge of the leaf may often curl in and start showing some brown, maybe some sort of striping, a little bit of damage that you might see that looks sort of like striping on the leaf surface as well. And that's signs of the thrips doing their kind of rasping damage to the leaf surface. Bright, bright light, a high, high, uh, magnification lens will help you to actually see the thrips but thrips are also able to be caught on the sticky tra uh, sticky traps as well so aphids thrips spider mites fungus gnats scale insects white fly and other just kind of you know crummy little guys that are flying around your house this is a great product to uh, just have at your disposal to catch small infestations or like i said figure out what the heck is going on so that you can then go towards treatment. I have worked with insecticidal soap now for a couple of applications to try to treat thrips. It is, um, it's on the label and you've got to stay on it. So you've got to respray about every seven to 10 days to really get the thrips top and bottom. And after several weeks now, I have at least one, it's a philodendron micans that's got thrips on it at home. And I'm worried that it's going to spread further on the plant. And it's a big plant such as this one on a totem. We've got a plant that is trailing, kind of dense. It's hard for me to get tops and undersides of all of this with the spray. Just by the arrangement of the plant, the density of it, it is very difficult for me to think that I've done a uh, really thorough job with the spray. So after treating it for a couple of applications of spray, I have now gone to the next level, and that is the systemic houseplant granules. So this systemic houseplant insect control, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is a neonicotinoid. This is imatocloprid is the active ingredient. 
This is a chemical that normally we wouldn't necessarily want to use outdoors. It has some potential uh, harm to pollinators and other insects outside because of course it's an insecticide. But inside in our potting soil uh, or in our you know house plants, we are probably not going to have bumblebees and pollinators and all those kinds of things that we're working so hard to protect. In our house, we're really working hard to protect our plants. And so this product makes perfect sense when you've tried a lot of other options, or if you have a plant that is just perpetually having a pest problem, then using a systemic granule is probably one of the smartest ways to go. This is a like powder that is sprinkled onto the surface of the soil slightly incorporated into the top of the soil like with a plastic fork or something and then watered in to kind of deliver into a liquid solution down into their roots. Now the plant is going to then take it up into itself and have the chemical inside the plant for up to two months which stops then uh, the pests that are sucking and, and chewing on the plant um, by them being able to then, you know, access the chemical through the leaf surface. You want to re always read the label to find out how much to use per container size. This is only for container plants and it's listed just for indoor control. And after that initial watering, you don't want to water your plants too heavily for at least a good 10 to 14 days so that you're not flushing out too much extra of this before your plant has a chance to take it up. When plants are actively growing, so during the active growing months, March through September, is the most effective months to use a systemic because again, our plants are doing more like active uptake from their root system. Later in the season, we have more, uh, you know, dormant season especially, they're not drawing as much up from the root so it's not as uh, helpful that time of year in which case you could use a spray to kind of keep things in control and maybe go to the systemic as we get into you know the active growing season again <clears throat> i brought this pothos and joy uh, simply because again pothos uh, or epiprenums and other philodendrons also known to get mealy bugs Often, you know, it's something that, again, it's a dense plant. There's a lot of foliage, so you need to look closely. Anytime your plants seem to be failing or just not looking perky enough, um, it is, that is a good, a good reason to look more closely at what's going on. I was talking with a friend recently who said he's always focused on new leaves and new growth. He's always admiring and looking closely at the newest leaf well i mean who can blame you they're the prettiest usually and uh, we're always so excited that our plants grow in a new leaf that that's what we focus on but usually the new leaves are not the ones that are going to show signs of pest problems unless as i mentioned they're aphids often it's the lower older foliage that we aren't paying much attention to, we don't maybe even see as easily, that is what comes down with insects. So looking closely at the lower portion, at the inner portion of the plants, different angles, and as I mentioned multiple times, bright, bright light and a good uh, high magnification hand lens or magnifying glass will help, especially those of us that have aging eyes uh, and maybe just don't see very well in the first place. So with that being said, uh, I hope that this has been an enlightening and informative uh, session today. If you have questions or follow-up, feel free to put them in the comments and I will answer after if we haven't addressed that question already. If you are a local and you've got some pest issues uh, that you'd like some help with, we highly encourage you to bring a leaf sample down to us in a sealed container, whether that's a zip top bag, a baby food jar, whatever, please keep it contained so that we're not exposing our plants to pests. We are also available for uh, virtual houseplant consultations uh, that can be found on our website. Um, and we just wanna, you know, 
we want your plants to thrive and we want you to thrive as well. So uh, with that being said, thanks as always for watching. Happy gardening.